for everyone. And our lecturer today is Dr. Noel Ballesteros from uh, Philippines. And uh, Noel will be speaking to us on oral health and hygiene care in elderly patients. Pleased to note on the panel, we have uh, Professor Callum Durwood uh, from Cambodia and Dr. Jacob Johns from uh, Malaysia. Uh, Noel, thank you for giving up your time and thank you for um, agreeing to give this lecture. And we look forward to hearing it from you now. Thank you, Professor Rahman. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, good day everybody. I'm Dr. Noel from the Philippines. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Global Child Dental Fund for this opportunity to speak on special care dentistry. Uh, today I've been tasked to give a talk on oral health care for the elderly. Actually, I'm a pediatric dentist and you must be wondering why I'm giving a lecture on geriatric dentistry. My mom passed away four years ago at the age of 90 she was suffering from Parkinson's disease and later developed dementia, and I took care of her. And I saw the rapid decline of her health, including her problems on oral health. And I realized that a lot of her oral health problems were preventable had I known better. Okay, I'm not very proud of what is happening in the Philippines. This picture was posted on Facebook last July. It's a dental mission program that quite violated all the safety protocols for the pandemic. Now, most of our programs for the elderly are still the traditional unsafe dental missions consisting of dental extractions and construction of free dentures. The aging population certainly deserve better than this. So I do hope that this short lecture will inspire students to pursue a more compassionate dental practice. Now, dentistry is not just about fixing teeth. It's about treating a person as a whole, oral health being an essential component of general health. So what are the statistics? There were 703 million uh, people who are over 65. That's 2019. The highest number can be found in Eastern and Southeast Asia at 260 million. And it's expected to grow over 1.5 billion in 2050. Now, oral health among older persons is definitely a neglected field. We do not have sufficient data. In an oral health survey conducted by the FBI, only 44% of the countries responded. In the Philippines, we have no data on oral health status of our senior citizens. The aging population definitely belong to the vulnerable and marginalized groups. Now, what I have learned throughout my years in practice is that oral health is a human right. It is not a privilege of only those who can afford to pay, but also of the poorest of the poor. Oral health is a human right of everybody throughout a person's life cycle. We call it from womb to tomb. In the Philippines, we have the expanded Senior Citizens Act, which grants benefits and special privileges to older persons. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, dental services are not included in our national insurance coverage. That's why there's an urgent need to promote equity, to push for reforms through policies, laws, and regulations that will address the oral health needs of those who need it more. What are some of my realizations? First, aging is universal. No one is exempted. Every individual, family, community, and society will go through the aging process. Aging is inevitable. Despite the advances in science and technology, no one can escape from this and it cannot be halted. However, it's a normal dynamic process. So normal aging should be uh, differentiated from the disease. So limited mobility and frailty, osteoarthritis and joint issues are some issues of normal aging, while dementia, Alzheimer's, hypertension, and diabetes are diseases. And we all know that the deteriorating physical and mental capabilities of the aged and the decline of self-care capabilities and the lack of access to quality health care 
will all result to poor oral health conditions leading to malnutrition, which may even accelerate the rapid deb debilitation of overall health leading to death. We must also fight AGSM is very harmful as it has a negative impact on the physical, mental, and social well-being of the elderly. Short, we shouldn't even poke fun on growing old as it stigmatizes aging and has a mental uh, impact on the elderly. Now here is our age classification of senior citizens. But for this lecture, I will be more on the descriptive classification. For the active and capable, they are robust. For the limited activity and capability, they are frail. And those with very limited activity and capability, they are dependent. Problems arise when the elderly become frail and they are more vulnerable to stress-related uh, conditions. So my lecture will focus more on the oral health care for the frail and the dependent. Now, uh, there are different levels of managing the patient, specifically the elderly. You have the mouth level, patient level, family level, and community level. For the patient level, first, we need to assess the patient, prevent and control the disease before we can treat them and maintain the, uh, the restorations. So first is assess. We need to assess patient capability and identify the risk factors toward oral disease. Actually, when I took care of my mom, that's the time that I really appreciated the definition of health. When I was younger, I thought being healthy was just what? Being able to go to the gym and then jog around. It's more of the physical. But when I took care of my mom and she lost her mental capabilities, so is her social well-being compromised. She couldn't already go to her social uh, functions and not being able to see her friends. That's why healthy is all about being physical, mental and socially healthy. So first is we assess patient capability, physical, mental, and social. So is my patient active or inactive? Is my patient medically well or is my patient compromised? Mental, is my patient cognitively well or cognitively impaired? Because there are, I, there are signs of cognitive impairment, like for example, uh, a lot of elderly will even verbalize that they are losing, they are becoming forgetful. So there's loss of short-term or long-term memory, confusion, impaired judgment, poor motor coordination, and even dysphagia. So when there's cognitive impairment, there's loss of self-care, and then there's the increase for oral disease. That's why we need to target the caregivers to take care of the elderly. Next is social. Is my patient independent or dependent? Because social and uh, our social isolation and loneliness is a growing concern among older people. And a lot of them, because of loneliness and depression, they have already given up. Uh, they have already given up living, and uh, they don't even consult the medical professional because of uh, psychological uh, isolation. Worse, a lot of elderly they go through life-changing health events, uh, like my mom and my dad. They suffered accident inside the bathroom. They, they suffer falls, and then oftentimes, uh, a lot of elderly, uh, they get stroke, heart attack, and then they are diagnosed with cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and all of these diseases have a large impact not only on the person, 
but also for the entire family. So after assessing patient capability, we identify the risk factors towards oral disease. So these are the following, which I will enumerate later on. And in so uh, in identifying the risk factors, I will also identify measures to prevent and control the spread of the disease by controlling the risk factors. First and foremost, it's very important what we need to learn is that restorations will not solve the disease. We must first control the disease. Why? During our undergraduates, oftentimes it's so much focus on dental restorations, but we all know that it will not control the disease. We must first control the disease and then after restoring or rehabilitating, we must also maintain. So this is a classic picture of, uh, oral, uh, of the oral health of the elderly. So there's root caries, gingival recession, coronal caries, gingivitis. So we first ask the question, why? So it's like a burning house. There are risk factors. You need first to get rid of the risk factors. Control the fire, and before you can build the house, you must first control the fire before you can restore and re rehabilitate. So what are the risk factors? Number one, systemic diseases and taking a lot of medications. So a lot of elderly, they suffer from chronic diseases and in, and in turn, they take a lot of medicines compounded by frailty and dependency and they lose their senses. That's why they take a lot of medicines. It's very important that we consult the physician and then update the medical history because a lot of these drugs can also cause serostomia. And you know that a lot of elderly, they have this uh, kit, their medicine kit, which contains a lot of maintenance drugs. Number two risk factor is serostomia or salivary gland hypofunction. We all know that uh, saliva is the natural defense mechanism against cavities. And if they are taking four maintenance drugs a day, more or, more or less they have already suffering from dry mouth, which can lead to mucositis, caries, crack lips, and even fissured tongue. So what are our recommendations? Drink lots of water or sip through a sip water regularly all throughout the day and limit alcohol and sugar sweetened beverages such as juices, sodas, teas, and uh, sugar uh, or uh, teas, juices. And since uh, your saliva is your natural defense mechanism against cavities, Sometimes they need uh, adjuncts, such as your calcium and phosphate creams, which will supply the lost calcium and phosphate uh, brought about by serostomia. Number three risk factor is lifestyle. So uh, a lot of elderly, as, as we all grow old, we get to acquire habits and most of them are bad. And worse, a lot of our elderly, they become stubborn because they, they just want to enjoy life. So these are some of the habits that they have acquired. Drinking alcohol, smoking, and they just want to enjoy life. They keep on eating even if the food is harmful for their health. So they do not care as long as they enjoy life. That's why they are also stubborn. So the number four risk factor is diet. So diet that is very rich in sugar will not only lead to more caries, root caries, coronal caries, but also to obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. That's why it's very important that we need to campaign. We need to have advocacies in our respective communities, such as this one, uh, sugar reduction. So uh, we need to campaign. 
instead of uh, these processed foods, maybe they go to the market and buy fresh fruits and vegetables. So number five risk factor, the lack of oral hygiene. So maybe they need a lot of help because uh, they lose the manual dexterity to brush on their own. So maybe uh, we need to modify their toothbrushes or introduce an electronic toothbrush. And most of the time they need assistance also. Next is uh, the fluoride toothpaste. And a lot of elderly, because they become high risk to root caries and coronal caries, they might, we might have to prescribe a 5,000 ppm fluoride toothpaste. And then the seventh risk factor, the lack of social support. So is my patient alone and independent or is she residing with a caregiver? or does she live in a nursing home? So what is uh, quite risky is when they are living alone and they suffer depression and loneliness. Number eight risk factor is, does my patient have a, has a dental home? So a dental home is more about a relationship. It's more of regular dental care. So uh, when you talk of dental home, we talk of primary oral health care, services that are essential but continuous. So we need to see them every three months. Accessible, most of them are not mobile. So it's either they go, uh, we go for uh, teledentistry or we might have to go to uh, uh, homes for the elderly. And it is coordinated with the medical and it is family-centered, uh, we target the caregivers and also the family if they have. So uh, uh, this is what we are campaigning right now, dental home as primary oral health care, that every community health center must be competent or must be um, well-equipped to provide primary care for the elderly or we tap on volunteerism. We might have to adapt uh, homes for the elderly because they cannot go to uh, a health facility. So after preventing control, then we might have to treat the elderly. So uh, a lot of them might have to go, uh, might not just need prevention, but those who are at risk might have to undergo chronic disease management. But for some, palliative care, and for some, we, we might have to refer them to the experts because they might have to go through a hospital care. Why? Because a lot of elderly, they suffer from secondary coronal caries and failed restorations, and they are prone to root caries. Why? Because of uh, gingival recession and the medications they that they are taking, which may, may produce serostomia. That's why we are introducing rational treatment planning because the ideal treatment planning might not be feasible for the elderly and they might only be possible for the functionally independent. But once the patient becomes frail and functionally dependent, we might have to uh, be more rational in our treatment plan. So what is rational treatment planning? We ask the following question. What does the patient want? What can the patient tolerate? What is realistic? And what can the patient afford? Because most of them are already retired. And the ideal treatment plan may not be possible because of a lot of behavior problems, medical problems, budget constraints. And when we go to elderly homes, there are limitations in technology time constraints such as life expectancy and tolerance threshold and we need to also respect patient autonomy like some of them might not be ready for invasive treatment. That's why rational treatment planning is not about achieving the perfect result. Oftentimes we just want to control the disease, the spread of the disease and improve quality of life, specifically uh, preventing pain and spread of infection.
That's why when treating elderly, we need to give training on in minimal intervention and minimally invasive dentistry. So the ICCMS um, has non-invasive techniques. So you have your primary prevention, your non-operative care, and your tooth-preserving operative care. So this is the non-operative care. We do prophylaxis, apply fluoride varnish, prescribe high uh, fluoride toothpaste, and we might have to do glass ionomers specifically on root surfaces and the silver diamine fluoride, which are all non-invasive. Now, so for the tooth-preserving operative care, we might have to do indirect pulp capping using the glass ionomers. And of course, your ART fillings, and in the United States, they call it IPR. So these are non-invasive, atraumatic, non-technology dependent, and they are uh, more affordable, which is quite ideal for the elderly. So this is uh, from the slides of Dr. of Professor Ian Nguo, application of 2.26 fluoride varnish. And the silver diamine fluoride, the fluoride varnish is for coronal caries, but for the dentine caries, uh, we do the 38% silver diamine fluoride. Uh, if we want to spread, uh, control the spread of infection. And this has been supported by a lot of studies and uh, there are still ongoing studies on its effectiveness. And of course, for self-care is very important. So there are so many products in, at the uh, uh, commercially available. And glass ionomers, these are feelings that can really control the spread of the disease because they contain fluoride, which will arrest caries. And there are also, there are also reservoirs of fluoride where they will uh, accept and absorb fluoride from other uh, from other products, such as your toothpaste and mouthwashes. Again, this is uh, lifted from Dr. Brostek's uh, uh, cases uh, with your GIs on your uh, root surfaces and your cervical lesions, and which is quite very common among the elderly. Now, a lot of restorations cannot be restored ideally. So oftentimes because of medical problems, you cannot put crowns, you cannot put the ideal restorations. So we can put the glass ionomers. Uh, personally, I find the flowable glass ionomers very, very uh, convenient, uh, specifically for patients with dementia. I placed one uh, on my mom's uh, uh, lesions uh, cavities. Next, after treatment, we maintain. So maintenance is very important. So regularly, we put fluoride varnish, uh, monitor the, the use of fluoride toothpaste. You might have to prescribe calcium phosphates or saliva substitutes, and then radiographs if possible. So remember, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So that's what compassionate dentistry is all about. That's why we are initiating right now a healthy aging protocol. So oral health in all policies. And prevention starts at age 50 because it's the youth of old age. Uh, when, I, when I became, uh, when I turned 50, that's the time that I took care of my parents and uh, I realized that as early as age 50, I already have class 5 lesions and even uh, gingival recessions. So I need to prepare and myself and my patients for the aging process. But most of our patients at 50, they are under, they are in denial. So what he's saying, maybe give them time to accept that yes, we are all growing old. And preventive care while the patient is still relatively healthy, that they can go back to their dentist. Uh, prepare the recently old for their advancing age because what we do now has an impact later on. So 
uh, once there are already class 5 lesions, root exposure, try to cover them up with your glass ionomers because they are very susceptible to uh, spread. Why? Because the exposed dentinal tubules, which will result to cervical sensitivity, and they are more prone to acids, and they are also plaque trapped. And then I keep on telling my, uh, when I do lectures for the elderly, brush gently. Why? A lot of elderly, they brush vigorously with the thought that when they brush vigorously, they are cleaning the teeth better, which is very, uh, which is a misconception. So healthy lifestyle begins at 50. So ideally when they reach 80, they, are still, they are still have 20 teeth a dentition that is free from active caries, so on and so forth, that all restorations are functional and they can eat well. And if we have baby book, I want to introduce the healthy aging diary because most of them become forgetful. This is also for the caregivers. So they have a checklist, which, are, which is the following. So preventive non-invasive measures done every three to six months. So uh, it's also very important that we spread this specifically for the younger generation because all of us will go through this, uh, this uh, stage in life. So this is an example of a dental home for the elderly. So this is, a group, uh, this is an adopted uh, community most of them are already frail and dependent. So it is co coordinated with a medical organization in the Philippines. So uh, they, they do prophylaxis for uh, the elderly who can tolerate it. But we tried dental chairs, but most of them are wobbly. So we improvised them, we uh, instituted, uh, we introduced the dental beds, which are more stable. So this is was during the pandemic. They still undergo care, checkups and non-invasive treatment. And never forget uh, motivating caregivers. So right now we have installed uh, television sets so we can monitor them and talk to them through the television. And then advoca advocacy is very important, like uh, brushing. We have this happy brushing to you anthem. And then also we ask the visitors not to bring sugary beverages and foods, just healthy foods. So uh, at this point, we also have introduced teleoral health. And this is very important also for the elderly because they cannot go out of their homes. So to, uh, to conclude my lecture, uh, I will lift this, lift this from the FBI World Dental Federation, the eight core pillars to improve the oral health of the older adults. So oral care should always be integrated with general care. So we encourage our government to uh, integrate oral health in all policies. Uh, K-dramas are very popular in the Philippines and this is the recent K-drama that we have seen that uh, specifically for the oral health to enjoy life, they should be enjoying all the foods that they should be eating. So eating well is very important. And then promote oral health through life course. That's why uh, there are stages, but for the elderly, it starts at prevention starts at age 50, and all of our actions should be evidence-based. And then financial barriers, so we intend to include this in our insurance uh, policies. And physical barriers, because they are no longer mobile, so we have uh, oral, uh, mobile oral health care ser services. And the pandemic has also given us the opportunity to really use teledentistry. So this is an example of one of our mobile dental uh, buses. 
and then provide appropriate oral health care, specifically the use of minimal uh, invasive dentistry and mobilize all stakeholders. So it's not just dentists doing oral care, but we need the help of everybody, including the medical organizations, the nurses, the midwives, the nurses, and globally, uh, we need the help of uh, everybody, the research, public health professionals, media, uh, down to the smallest unit, the patients and their families. And we want to learn from best practices from other countries. So that's why collect and share best practices are very important. Sharing is caring. So to conclude, uh, we are now in the Philippines, we are really uh, pushing the universal health care. It's already a law, but we need to include oral health in our uh, universal health care. Okay, so uh, it's really a struggle in the Philippines. So I'm sure a lot of students are watching right now. I know that all students are vying for the highest honor. But after you graduate, uh, I would like to say that to care for those who once cared for us is one of the highest honors. And with that, thank you very much for your time. And I hope uh, we inspired you that after you graduate, uh, you take time to take care of the elderly. Maraming salamat po and thank you. Dr. Noel, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was excellent, really excellent. So I'm a pediatric dentist like yourselves and, um, and I couldn't have done um, uh, at such a good lecture. So thank you for that contribution. Um, we're gonna have a short question and answer. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Callum if he would like to kick off. Any comments or questions? Sure, I really enjoyed your presentation, Dr. Noel. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking, um, do you think that dental students are exposed enough to the to elderly patients during their training? Um, because I think if you're not exposed, then you're you're not comfortable sometimes treating groups of patients like the elderly. So what's your opinion about that? Uh, yes, Professor Kalum, I really do agree. Uh, here in the Philippines, the students are more into the technical and their exposure is just what? Uh, uh, their training is more tooth-centered and when they get to face elderly patients, they do not know what to do. And because basically it, uh, there's really lack of training and lack of exposure in treating elderly, specifically the frail and the dependent. Um, in the Philippines, they just get, uh, they recruit patients just to fulfill the requirements for complete dentures and removable partial dentures. But then again, that's very technical and tooth-centered. That's why uh, part also of our campaign and advocacy is to reach out to the universities on how we can really be more effective in addressing uh, the marginalized, specifically the elderly, which starts during the undergraduate training. So exposure is very important, really. It's, it's, it's so yeah. important. Yes, I do agree. Yes, and, and all of us Asian countries have all got a growing number of elderly, um, and it's becoming going to be much more of a problem in the future. And we have to be able to uh, provide services for that group. Yes, I, I do agree, yes. Uh, we need to train the next gen, we, we need to mold the next generation and prepare them. Uh, that's why we need to reach out to the students. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I do agree. Thank you. Um, any follow up uh, comments, uh, Callum, or any other questions? Uh, perhaps you could comment on the diets of elderly people. Do you think that their diets change as they grow older? And 
what sort of changes affect their oral health, do you think? Well, uh, well, in uh, my experience, uh, usually good diet really be begins when during your younger years. And then when you grow old, you develop this uh, healthy lifestyle. But uh, I've seen a lot of elderly, they just want to enjoy life and they just take in whatever they want, even if it's not healthy for their teeth. Like, uh, well, here in the Philippines, uh, they love drinking alcohol. And we, uh, they, uh, we love uh, all of this uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol uh, foods, meat, and all of this fatty, uh, this fatty diet. And they, uh, it's very common here in the Philippines. So I, I really feel it's really cultural. Uh, that's why uh, we really need more, we, need, we really need to be more active. Uh, <laughs> it's all fat and cholesterol. <laughs> oh, really, and really sugar to too, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, Filipinos really love sugar. That's why we have one of the highest caries prevalence in the world. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really yeah. bad. <laughs> okay. Lifestyle, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jacob, any comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Prof. Raman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noel, for the presentation. Looks like I'm outnumbered here. Three pediatric dentists and one prosthodontist. The closest to the geriatric is <laughs> the minority. Uh, yes. Very interesting presentation, Dr. Noel. Thank you. Uh, just two comments uh, from what Prof. Callum mentioned just now. Uh, one, the institutions, probably we have to look into universities without walls, okay? Because uh, we are very focused on all our teaching in the clinical setup, whereas now we have to start thinking about managing community in the community. I suppose that's, that's something that uh, we have to uh, really look into because especially like you said just now uh, in Eastern and Southeast Asia, the number of elderly is really growing up and we have not equipped, you know, our students to the level that they can take care of those who are functionally dependent on us. Uh, that was one thing. And then probably the diet, maybe I am a culprit. Uh, I think the teeth, the teeth is the, the key. Once you lose your teeth, once you have lesser occluding components, then they start changing their diet to be able to just eat and swallow it rather than chew and uh, you know appreciate those kind of food. So that is when probably they will try to change the diet to the less fibrous and you know more uh, starchy kind of food. Dr. Noel, I just want to ask you, you, you started off by showing your, um, uh, the, the slide where you, know, you said it is not, um, we are not proud of the fact that you know treatment is being provided. I, I think again it is a global, or rather even in in this region, it is something that you know it it happens very often. Now one of the reason will be probably because we do not have proper policies in place where we have our dental practitioners going out and providing that care because of all the legal issues as well as regulations. How do you think we can overcome this in the you know, in the future where we can have some understanding from our policy makers about the importance of providing this sort of case by the professionals rather than uh, yes. in a very uh, unhygienic me method. Yes, Professor Jacob. Actually, uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm already a policy maker in the Philippines. I've just been appointed as the chief of the oral health division of the Department of Health two months ago. So right now we're working on policies and um, we really need uh, one of my colleagues at the Ministry of Health, at the Department of Health told me, you know, Noel, uh, what is lacking among dentists is that uh, you, you are so focused on the clinical and we are less on the advocacy, on the health, oral health promotion side. It seems that, well, at least in the Philippines, we are 
uh, our training is just focused on the clinical and less on being an advocate, a mediator, an enabler. So we really need also to train our students to really go out and be advocates. Okay. So um, in my case, we really need to connect with the politicians. We need, uh, I'm telling all dentists to go out of their clinics and do oral health promotion, specifically among local government officials and even the national officials. We need to have champions inside the government. We need, we need to identify advocates, champions among our Congress men and also among the Senate, and then convince them how oral health is important to general health. And that will also start with policies. Right now in the Philippines, we are formulating a national oral health policy that is aligned with the universal health care. So uh, it all starts with policy, but again, the next step is the implementation, which is oftentimes a problem, specifically here in the Philippines. So it's a really deep problem, it's a huge problem, but hopefully if we can really inspire others and go beyond the clinical, uh, I'm very positive that uh, we can institute changes step by step. Mm. Good, that's really helpful. Um, no, let me just ask, there's two questions I would like to ask is, um, traditionally, when we saw seniors and healthcare for um, an older population, we always thought of dentures. We thought of dentures or extractions, and um, and that was the common um, care that was perceived for this population. But we have a group of uh, increasingly dentate seniors uh, with complex restorations, and so they could have implants, they could have lots of things in their mouth, which it, it makes care very much more difficult. And I just wondered whether you would reflect on that, of how the changing nature of oral health for seniors is really uh, complicating this situation. Uh, okay. Uh, well, here in the Philippines, uh, all of these complex restorations, implants are really very, very expensive. Uh, that even, it's only the, re, uh, the rich can really afford it. But uh, for the increasingly dentated people, hopefully if the universal health coverage will cover oral health care, hopefully we might be able to uh, address this issue issues and get funding for, for the other uh, oral health problems of the elderly. But okay. at this point, we are really prioritizing the primary oral health care. Okay. Hopefully I, I, we'll get there, but at this point, it's really expensive. And, yeah. <laughs> and most I, of them I, have I, medical I, problems. I, I understand. No, I, 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 I empathize with what you're um, saying. Um, so th there's an age-old debate in dentistry about specialists. And, um, and there you are as a pediatric dentist talking about care of the elderly. But do you th think that with the issue that Callum has raised with a growing number of seniors, the fact that these seniors have more complex problems, plus the fact that we have uh, uh, this population living older uh, and having uh, comorbidities, do you see that we will have a specialty of gerodontology? Um, and is that something you would welcome? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, very much welcome here in the Philippines, geriatric dentistry, because right now there are no geriatric dentists in our country. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's why I feel so bad because the all elderly population do not receive the proper oral health care that they really deserve. So yeah. I really do welcome. In fact, I even talked to the Philippine Dental Association, the mother country organization, 
that uh, maybe we can start uh, promoting a uh, geriatric dentistry in the Philippines so mm -hmm. that the awareness will spread that, hey, uh, our country needs specialists. We need geriatric dentists to provide tertiary care for these population groups. Gosh, okay, that's very interesting. It's, um, uh, I think that's, that's the case. I think there's a growing issue and uh, a, it's a logical argument to, to say we need specialists in this area. But so that's really helpful. I'm going to turn finally to uh, Callum and uh, Jacob. Is there any final comments or questions you would like to ask? Just to add to that last point about the need for specialists in special needs dentistry and geriatric dentistry, but there's also a need for others such as dental therapists mm. who can go in to places where there are a lot of older people who are dependent, frail, um, and help them to maintain their oral health, just using simple techniques. I think that's another area that also is needed. Very good point. Thank you so much. Jacob, is there any final comment you want to make? Yeah, and to add to that, uh, that would also help in uh, uh, reducing the cost for the, the, the service providers. And uh, it is being practiced in uh, a few uh, pockets, I think, in, in Japan. They have already started doing this. So, yeah, that is also very, very essential. I think you cannot be depending only on the dentist, but you yeah. have to add the auxiliaries, empower the auxiliaries to be able to help out in this uh, service also. Okay. Thank you. It's a very interesting, very good point to, to end in. Um, our medical colleagues have general nurses uh, with extended duties. So they learn a particular technique or something and they have extended duties. We have a large number of dental assistants and uh, we should be looking at some extended duties uh, that they may want to undertake. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's a very interesting and fertile debate. With that, we want to say thank you and we'll uh, now uh, wish you well.